Hello and welcome to the Optional Enrichment Activity Support. This lesson will support your practice for 2.3 functions and a practice for 2.3a which has a couple of problems. So again these are just additional an additional lesson to support some of the enrichment activities you will find in our enrichment folder. The objective today in this lesson we will evaluate functions using function notation however we'll use a little bit more um, advanced problem solving. We will also determine rate of change given a table of values um, when the rate of change varies from point to point. So let's start off with the first problem here. It says find the value of h of x equals 2x squared plus 6x minus 3. This is a quadratic equation. It says when x equals 4a. So the way we would solve something like this is we would replace the x values with 4a. So essentially in a problem like this, what you have been used to seeing is h of 6 or h of 5, but what you really have here is h of 4a. And what you need to think about is that this 4a replaces every x value in your quadratic equation. So in place of x, you would then put 4a. In place of x here, you would put 4a. And this week earlier, you just had, again, maybe something like h of 4, and you would replace the, all the x values with a 4. But we can do this with variables as well. So let's look at this example here. When we replace all the x values with 4a, we have to be very careful that we keep the parentheses around the 4a. If you'll notice in this first one, I'll underline it here, 4a is being squared. Up here, x value is being squared. By keeping it in parentheses, you're making sure that you're squaring the 4 as well as the a. And then when we move on, again, we're replacing the x value here up here with this 4a. Keeping it in parentheses means that whatever we are multiplying on the outside will be multiplied by what is in parentheses. And then we have the minus 3. So in order to solve this, we end up with 2. 4a squared means we square the 4 and get 16. We also square the a to get a squared. Notice how we squared both of those terms. And then we can multiply 6 times 4a in its entirety and get 24a minus 3. Simplifying that, we can do 2 times 16 to give us the 32a squared plus 24a minus 3. Notice that now our final answer is in terms of a because we substituted 4a for all of our x values. All right, let's look at another one. This one's a little bit more difficult. This is similar to the function notation you've been seeing again. <clears throat> it says find f of 3h plus 2. Well again, whatever we have in here is what we're going to be substituting in place of all the x values in our equation. So again, we have another quadratic equation this is called. We have two x values. We're going to have to substitute with 3x plus 2. So again, use parentheses for the substitution so that you don't get errors. In this first x, we have an x squared, so we are going to need to put parentheses around this whole expression so that we make sure we square it. And then we have a 2, and again, parentheses, once again, very important because we will be distributing the 2 into the parentheses afterwards. Now when you square 3h plus 2, that just means you have two of those expressions. So I'm going to write those out down here, 3h plus 2. When you multiply these together, some people um, remember how to do it by thinking of the acronym FOIL, first, outer, inner, last. But generally, it's the same thing as distributing a 2 into the parentheses. You do the same thing here, only you start with 3h. So you distribute 3h into the parentheses and multiply it by the first term and then by the second term. You move on to the 2, you take the 2 and you multiply it by the first term, 
and then by the second term, which then um, gives you another quadratic in our, once you combine like terms, and that's what this is here, actually, 9h squared plus 12h plus 4, and that has been simplified. In our second set of parentheses here, we are distributing the 2 in to the 3h to get 6h and the 2 times 2 to get 4 and then we have the minus 1. Our final step is to combine like terms which leaves us with our final answer. So it's a little bit more math but essentially it's the same concept as when you have f of 5, f of 4, f of negative 2. Whatever is in here in our function notation means that we are evaluating the function when x equals whatever is inside the parentheses. Let's try a couple of examples now together. If you'd like to stop the tape and give this a try and then come back and we can do it together, that would be fine. Otherwise, you can just watch and we can do it at the same time. So in example one, it says find the value of g of x equals 3x squared plus 4x plus 10 when x equals 3b. Okay, so essentially this means find the function g when we replace all the x's with 3b. Making sure to use parentheses, we have 3 times 3b in parentheses squared minus 4 times 3b plus 10. Okay, making sure that I follow my order of operations, I'm going to do my exponents first. 3 squared is 9 b squared is b squared minus 4 times 3b which is 12b plus 10. Okay, I'm very close. I just need to take the 3 and multiply it by the 9 to get 18b squared and the rest of it is already simplified and that would be my final answer. Notice, as we stated before, the x's are now substituted in with 3b, so we no longer have x's in our equation. Let's try this final example. In this example, it says find f of h minus 3. So find the function f when our x values are replaced with h minus 3. This one we have to be very careful because we have to make sure that our parentheses are in place h minus 3 squared minus 4 times h minus 3. All right, so again, we are going to FOIL this or multiply h minus 3 times h minus 3. Okay, so I'm going to do that over here. I'm going to have h minus 3 times h minus 3. So I would multiply h times h and get h squared, h times a negative 3 and get a negative 3h, negative 3 times h, negative 3h, negative 3 times negative 3 is positive 9. So essentially I distributed the h into the parentheses and then the 3 into the parentheses. Now I will just combine my middle two terms. So I will end up with h squared minus 6h plus 9. And now I have foiled this. So let's write that in there what we got. We got h squared minus 6h plus 9. And then we'll continue on. I have a negative 4 that I'm distributing into the parentheses. So negative 4h plus 12 plus 5. Okay, on um, my final step, I will just combine my like terms. I have h squared, then I have a minus 6h and a minus 4h, which gives me minus 10h. A plus 9 and a plus 12 and a plus 5, which gives me plus 26. And now I'm finished. Okay, our final extra deeper understanding lesson will be on rate of change and that'll be our next slide. Okay, 
average rate of change, remember, is just slope. And we have looked at calculating slope before, but this will be a little bit different. Sometimes with average rate of change, we don't have a perfectly constant slope. Let's review first what slope is. Let's just make sure we remember that slope is always the change in y, so y2 minus y1, over the change in x, x2 minus x1. And we know that if we have a linear equation, we can expect a constant rate of change between any two points. Our slope will be constant. However, when we're dealing with rate of change, sometimes we may have a linear equation, but our rate of change may not be perfectly constant. The goal is, though, is that is it very close. For example, if we take the, the rate of change between 3, 5, and 7, and 11, is that going to be similar to the rate of change between 7 and 11 and 13 and 19? Okay. If the rate of change between our first set of points, let me draw an arrow here, was, let's just say, for example, 3.8. And then we calculated the rate of change between the next set of points, and we got 10.2. We would know that these points do not represent a linear rate of change. If, on the other hand, the rate of change between the first two points was 1.1 and the rate of change between the second two points was 1.2, and you'd want to continue on and check a few more set of points given a table of values, and if they were all close to 1.1, you could have 1, you could have 1.1, 1.2. If they were all very close, then you could say we have a constant rate of change, and you would pick one of those rates of change to be your slope in your linear equation. So let's check. Let's find out what our rate of change is here in this table. So if we plug into our formula correctly, we have y2, we'll do our first set of points here, we have y2 which is 11 minus y1 which is 5 over x2 which is 7 minus x1 which is 3. So we get 3 over, or 6 over 4, excuse me, which reduces to 3 over 2. And we get a rate of change is at about 1.5 something. You know, maybe that's inches per year. We're talking about plant growth. Maybe that's ounces per second. We're filling a can or filling a cup full of water or something else. So depending upon the context in which this rate of change applies to. Now let's check our second set. So we got 1.5 here. So we'll go down to our next set of two points y2 in this one is 19 minus y1 which is 11 over x2 which is 13 minus x1 which is 7. So we end up with 8 over 6 which reduces to 4 over 3 and if we calculate that we end up with uh, about 1.3 3 approximately. And that's pretty close to 1.5. So for this problem, maybe I will say that my average rate of change is about 1.5 or 1.3. Either one of those would work. You know, and typically when you're doing this, you will see values you might see in your next set of 1.4 or your next set will be another 1.5. So the rate of change you want to choose is maybe the one that occurs most frequently, or perhaps it's an average. And again, these are pretty close, relatively speaking, so we can say maybe that we have a constant rate of change. Okay, and that concludes our lessons for deeper understanding. So good luck with your new material. Let me know if you need any help with it, and we'll see you next week.